Hey everybody, sorry we had technical difficulties. Andrea and, I, Andrea and I were trying to figure out how to do it behind the scenes, so now what we're going to do is I've just come on to the page, so we won't be able to talk back and forth, but as you guys join, uh, certainly uh, would, would take your questions and uh, welcome anything you want to talk about. Hey Andrea, I think I'm on this time. <laughs> All right, so we've got two people with us, that's awesome. Uh, again, I'm Greg Turquetta, you know, Executive Director of Communications, Collier County Public Schools, and um, excited about what I do and excited about sh uh, sharing with you guys today. So um, I'll, I'll start just telling you a little bit about what I'm about, and then if you, as you guys have questions, um, ask them away and I'll answer as many as I can. Um, I've, been, I've been in school PR for four years, uh, going on four years in August. I did 22 years in TV news prior to this, working from photographer special projects producer, up through management positions to eventually running a newsroom. And I got to a point where I said, you know, I want, I want to do something in life that is more meaningful and impactful in the, in the lives of children, which kind of led me to this. So I've been here in Collier County. Um, I'm a big fan of innovation and change. Uh, I, I don't come into it with any preconceived notions of how it used to be, how it has been, and what it should be. And, and that to me is when, when Andre was asking me, what's the hardest thing about what we do? That's it. Uh, when we come into an educa education, education is built on the rock of time. I mean, it, everything is supposed to be a certain way. It's been a certain way. And when you look at communications and education, and if you look at where those two intersect, that's the dead center of change. Um, and what has changed more than communications and education in the last just five years? And I think the next five years are going to be even more so. So we are the change agents, uh, whether we like it or not. I mean, the the... the our consumer, our parents, our students are demanding it. They, they now have these phones in their hand and they have the ability to instantaneous information and they expect us to perform just the same. And I embrace that. I, I like that part of it. I mean, maybe it's my news background, but I, I, we, we're here to serve our consumers. Um, hey, Mary Kay, how are you? Um, so that's, that to me is what I've brought, is why I say we're change agents and we're innovators, is we have to be a step ahead on the technology more so than our, than our families and our consumers are. Um, you, you only need to have one school crisis in your district to see how fast information moves, especially in the hands of students. One of our big priorities this year is working with students to get them accurate information and, and to get them a system to where we could even um, be getting the information out to them even faster so that we can cut off the rumor mill. And we all know what the rumor mill can do um, when it comes to a situation at a school. Uh, we're big on social media. All of our schools um, have Facebook and Twitter accounts. We have tweeters, uh, over a thousand now, that are um, that are up and running. And their mission is very simple: tell, t show, not tell, show in video, preferably the innovative and exclusive learning opportunities that go on in our classrooms every day. Let open the classroom window for parents to let them see uh, what's going on. Uh, because in an era of school choice, parents have choices, and I, I'm pro-choice. I think parents should have the ability to make a choice of what they think is best for their child, which means as a school system, we've got to be the best choice because you now have competition. You're no longer the postal service. You're no longer the, the cable company. Everybody has competition um, for the business of educating our children. And, and I think competition makes us better. So we use, we use all our tools. Uh, one of the things that I've talked about uh, to my team and, and I tell our media is we, our job is to be our own web company, our own television company, our own print uh, newspaper business to have direct conversations with our parents and our community. The media is great. Love the media. Love to have them involved. Love to get as much coverage as you can get. But at the end of the day, you now have all the tools to do the same thing. So are you utilizing? That's my question to you. Uh, it's a scary place. It's a scary place when you look at, oh, okay, we're going to roll these tools out to all our schools and we're going to train and we're going to teach people to use them. Right. They're already using them. The training pieces uh, isn't as complicated as, as you might think. The last piece of that, and I think this is the biggest one, we were discussing this last night on our K-12 PR chat. If you're not on that, please join us every other Tuesday, hashtag K-12 PR chat. Uh, we were talking about change and why change is hard. And to me, th this is a big one for me. It's the piece of change isn't hard unless you don't explain it properly. Everything that I've done in my district starts with the why. Why? Whether it's an internal communication piece, an external communication piece, whatever it is, is the idea that... If, you don't, if you're going to roll out anything and you're going to ask teachers or school administrators or even district staff to add one more thing to their already overfilling plate, 
um, you gotta you gotta get, get them to buy into it because with most of the initiatives that, that we launch in communications you're not paying them to do it you're asking for um, volunteers to step forward and say yes I buy into what we're trying to do for better communication the why is the answer to that um, and so I spend the majority of my days just asking that question. I walk around, why? Why are we doing this? Why are we? You know, you, you learned it when you were four, and you, parent, you get in trouble with your parents. Why are you always asking why? But, but that's, that's the piece. Um, so onboarding people. If you have new people coming into your school system, they're, they're, they, should all be, they should all be brand ambassadors. Now, here's the interesting part. People are going to talk about your school system either way, and they're going to talk about it based on their personal experience. So in our district, we have 7,000 employees. That's 7,000 different stories that could be told based on whether that employee is having a good day, a bad day, whether they were brand new and they were, went through an ori a proper orientation, or whether they feel their opinions being valued and their feedback is warranted. And so we, we have something called a voice group where we meet uh, with, the, with the community every quarter and we talk about what's going on and we get their feedback. And we, we then look at it and we show them communication campaigns and say, what, if, what in here is working, uh, what's not working real well and we, we take that feedback. Social media is great on the sunny days when you're showing all the, the happy kids working in class and all the amazing things they're doing. But the place where the value comes is on the stormy day. Uh, Collier County, Florida, Naples, Florida, go to Florida, go all the way down to the left corner is where I am. Uh, in September, we get hit by a category four hurricane, direct hit. And in the, the, the two weeks that followed that, is when you really see the value of having networks of people in place to share information and share stories. Uh, when you get hit by a hurricane, and if you're going to Ensper, you're going to hear about this because I'm really excited. I'm going to be presenting this um, on the Monday of Ensper, a two-hour interactive session, which is going to be exactly this. What do you do when you don't have power and you don't have cell service and your school district shut down? Half your community has been evacuated, and you're trying to find your employees to figure out what's next. Oh, and by the way, you got to see if your schools are still standing. Whatever you had planned the Friday before that Monday has now changed, and it's changed in a big way. So those are, those are huge, huge lessons. And so the biggest piece of that is when you have systems in place, Facebook became one of our key communication tools throughout it. Because think about it. If people have a cell phone and cell service was intermittent, when they did get the cell service, if it was intermittent, they were going to get information. And they went right to Facebook to see what their community looked like, what was standing next three streets over if they couldn't get there. But equally important is the people that evacuated used it as well. So we set record engagement numbers on Facebook and Twitter for the, um, in September of 2017. Uh, the fundraising that came in, school districts across the country were sending us supplies, school supplies, money, all based on what we were putting out on social media. Our principals, our teachers, my department were all out telling our story, showing what was going on, showing the families in need, showing the basic uh, necessities that weren't there to be provided. And the outpouring of support out honestly blew me away. Um, I mean, you know there's kindness in, in, in this whole country, but when you can rally it around a little tool like Facebook and let people tell their own stories, that power makes the hair on my arm stand up every time I tell it. So. What questions do you have? What can I tell you about? We do a lot of video work. We do a lot of social media work. Um, hey, Jeremy. Welcome. I, I'm a big fan, as I started out in the beginning, if you didn't hear it, about innovation and change. I think we have to look at everything we do. I don't, we, don't do we don't do newsletters. Why? We have Twitter and Facebook. I, mean, I, I get it. There's still paper copies of things that are, that are a big deal. Um, hey, Jason. How are you? Paper matters, everything matters, but one of the things I say to my team is my opinion doesn't matter. As the leader of our communications department, what I think matters none. It's have we done the research, have we put the race process in place to see what our consumer wants. Uh, in my school district, I tell you I have different schools that, that depending on their um, socioeconomic status, language barriers, that social media doesn't do much, a printed flyer still works. I have other schools that are religiously attached to um, phone calls, auto dialers. Uh, to me, that's the least effective. We give our parents the chance to opt in and opt out of what communication preferences they want to use. Last year, 75% of our parents that made a choice opted out of auto, auto dial phone calls. We know why. We all know why. They're intrusive. Uh, they interrupt the day. And far too often, they were relaying information that wasn't urgent. So we reset, um, we put out a whole communications roadmap 
for our schools and said, here's the prescription of how we should be using each of these tools. Uh, my personal thing is an auto dialer should only be used for something that is worthy of interrupting my day. It's that important that I have to stop and hear this. Text message, love it. Um, app alerts, we, we use them. Um, you know, social media and our website are, are, are strong. But when you have a crisis in your district and all of a sudden you see, hey, Turin, great question. Uh, how do I encourage parents or community members to follow your page? I was actually about to answer that just as you asked it, which is uh, if, you, if, you're crisis, if you're in a crisis, like during the hurricane, we picked up thousands of Facebook and Twitter followers. They know when something's going down that that's going to be the, f the fastest place. The other thing is sometimes our local media outlets will pick up our Twitter feed and put it right on their homepage. We control the information faster than anybody. That just makes good sense. Share what we're already putting out. Um, Jim, how do you, do you post or communicate different information on different social media platforms? And then your second question is cut off a little. Is your audience different on each social media platform? No. Um, when I look at the analytics of what we're doing, our Facebook and Twitter audiences, we're, let me give you the baseline. We're in a heavy retirement, um, we're in a heavy retirement area, but we also have a, an incredible cross-section of affluence and poverty. So Facebook and Twitter, when my, the analytics are showing me, is, is predominantly women 25 to 45. And, and watching what they consume certainly has swayed some of the content I put there. Uh, Twitter is a little bit more on the newsy side, a little more male than Facebook, but predominantly female. The website, our website is like one and a half clicks and done. They're coming uh, for specific content. So uh, we, we do have Instagram. Instagram I've been using a little here or there, haven't had a lot of inroads with it. Margaret, um, there is no such thing as an Apple alert. What I uh, meant to say was App Alert on our, um, on our app and the push notification. So sorry for that confusion. Um, the biggest thing with the social media channels, in my opinion, is you just got to play with what works. Like sports doesn't work on our Facebook page. The stories with the feels do, which if you look at the audience, women 25 to 45, that, that would make sense. But um, people in general, and again, we're three, we're three years in on the schools having accounts. We're two years in on the teachers, uh, 1,000 teachers producing content on their own Twitter accounts. But the consistency has been people want to hear great news. They want to know that they made a, ch a, a great choice in putting their kids in your schools. Open the window to the classroom and give it to them. Let the teachers do it. Um, I did this presentation last year about the tweacher um, thing. It's not as hard as it sounds. If you can get past the fear of, oh my God, we're going to give them tools. What if they, um, what if they don't use them properly? You, you have procedures in place. I'm telling you the reward to that is far out, uh, outweighed any risk. And there's only been three instances where I've had to clean up a social media issue, and none of them were on their professional accounts. It was on employees who were using personal accounts and said some things. Carol, how do you measure social media success? That's a good question, because uh, you can fall in love with analytics, and the analytics and the growth rate. I'm not in love with analytics or growth rate. I'm looking for, I'm looking for interaction. I'm looking for engagement, and I'm really looking for the grocery store interaction. What I mean by that is when people come up to you and say, thank you for giving us this. Here's how I'm using it. New teachers come up to me and say, thank you for letting me look into other classrooms because I can go and take their best practices and use them. Um, I look at it when classrooms are starting to do academic challenges back and forth between classrooms. These were things that, you know, when you sat back and dreamt it up, none of it was really in there. So, uh, so, so it really is, um, yeah, I can look at the analytics and I can see the growth. Um, for as long as we've been at this, I mean, we've, um, we have five times as many followers as we had on Facebook to start. It's still not a number that I want, but we got a long way to go. Um, let's see, let me back up a comment here. Jeremy, say you're interested in a position like yours that doesn't exist. If your district or school doesn't have much of a coordinated social media for it, how do you push this from the outside as well as sell yourself? That's a good one. Um, if, if, your interest, if, if your district doesn't appear to have much of a coordinated social media effort, one, I'm going to say they probably don't have competition because I learned this at Ensper a couple years ago. I started seeing that people were showing up that were former teachers or other things that had been moved in communication positions. And they were saying, oh, I'm a first-time communications person. I said, interesting. Why? And the commonality came, oh, we have charter schools in our district now. Oh, we have a private school push that's coming on. So this is a value proposition, and it's not just the social media. It's my position in general. If my position doesn't exist, then I would question the superintendent as to at what level is communication a priority and what they're trying to do. 
And, and you will find, and one of the other things, I think Tom DeLapp once said this, there's two things that get superintendents fired, politics and lack of communication. Um, so lack of communication is a, is a huge one. There's something in, in and I'll, I'll come back around Jeremy on this, I promise. There's something that I've kind of termed educational arrogance. And in four years in this field, I've started, I've seen it in a lot of different places in a lot of different states, uh, including here in Florida. Educators are experts, they're PhDs. They forever have been, give us your children, we're the experts in education, we'll educate them, and we'll bring you in um, to be a partner in that. Or not. Or it's when questioned, some people will rear up with, well, we're the experts. And I don't think it can be looked at that way anymore. I mean, it, the, it takes a parent, it takes a community, it takes a school, it takes leadership to bring all that around. But to, to, to the glue that holds all of that together is the communications piece. Um, you know, so we did a major initiative two weeks ago where we announced we're locking uh, all, all the doors on all 50 of our schools. We told our internal staff hours before we went public with it. Why? Internal communication matters. I need my I need my employees not finding out about it from a Facebook post or from hearing it in the media. So, so the, that communication piece has to be huge. You know, I'm a cabinet member in my district. That says a lot about the value of communication in our district. If you have a seat at the table, your opinion matters, and you can sway some things. If you don't, you need to have that conversation um, to get it together. Um, Jeremy, I also think I've met a lot of districts from across the country where it's not an organized effort. A high, couple of high schools and a middle school may have gotten out ahead of the district and have pages. That's fine, but you have to rein it in. Because we coordinated it so much so that I put them all under one hashtag on Twitter. And it was hashtag CCPS proud was our first one, then it went to hashtag CCPS success. And I, I wanted it in one place so that while it was in its infancy, people could go to one hashtag and see everywhere and see everything. And, and that got traction, and, but again, as I said earlier, you've got to explain the why. Because if you're going to try to run a social media effort from the outside as well as sell yourself, you have to be the why guy or gal. You have to explain why this matters, why we should be spending time on it, and why any of it matters. I mean, that's the, that's the big part about it. Uh, Linda, I think I started going into the superintendent. Comments, this is another battle. When I first got here, our, our, our accounts were shut down. Uh, they just weren't, the district counts, there were no comments, there was no anything. And I asked the question, why? And I was basically told, there's no plan for it, which is a great comeback. If you're going to ask why we can't do something, you should come forward with a plan of how to do it, how to do it responsibly, and how to make it work. So Facebook comments were an issue in our district because nobody likes to be criticized, right? I mean, it's, and when public education can get criticized from a lot of different angles. So what I did to do, get the buy-in was simple. And I looked at them and I said, they're going to talk about us whether we see it or not, right? There's, we have like a, a, a marketplace, a, like a yard sale community group in our town, and they talk about education on there. It was the last place I expected to find it, but they didn't have anywhere else to go, so that's where they went. So I, uh, my pitch to our district leaders were, we can help steer the conversation. We can put fact inside the emotion that may be running or the fiction that may be out there on an issue. We can interject in that if they're having a conversation in a place we can participate. And the honest truth is, it doesn't happen that much. There's conversation, um, but it's not a bashing that people are worried. Our principals were worried they were going to get crucified on issues, and it, and it really didn't go that way, and it hasn't gone that way in three years. There's been a couple of cases where something has come up that's caught national attention, and it's a three-day firestorm, and then it goes away. But the buy-in piece to me is critical in that if the school board doesn't see the value in hearing from its constituency, if the superintendent doesn't see the value in seeing how the initiatives are being received, um, I prefer that information. If, and if you believe in the race process, which I do, um, I want to research that ahead of time anyways. So before we were working on this door locking campaign, I was in our front office of our schools talking to our staff going, these are the communication pieces I'm putting together. What am I not seeing? Where, when I have to do a tutorial video for a staff on this, what does it need to look like? What, what don't I understand from not doing your job? And those conversations to me are invaluable. And I did, I've done that with everything we've done with our communications initiatives, and especially social media, is you can't walk in and ask a principal to do social media if you haven't figured out how it's going to fit in their day or the systems in place so they don't have to produce the content. Our superintendent's posting is optional. Why? Because we put the pages in place. We had Facebook up running for a year, and of course there wasn't enough content. There never is. If you just rely on the administrators, they're putting out fires all day. So in year two, we came back around, and I said, well, how about this? 
how about we take a teacher leader from each grade level or in high school, different subject areas, science, social studies, um, you know, one of the academies in math. Can we give them access to the school Facebook page to post as the school? You trust them to be team leaders. Would you go here? Sure. So we have tech teams. All, all of our schools have tech teams where there's anywhere from two to some schools are up to 15 where they have access to the school accounts and they post content straight to it. Now, at the same time, I still have those teachers having their own professional Twitter accounts because we want to maintain their classroom anonymity from that and everything they post in the classroom we don't want to put onto the school page. But not that innovative. It's just risky. It's risky putting your neck out there to say, principal, I got an idea that will work. Trust me, I'll run it for you. I'll train everybody. We'll get it up to speed and then it will go. And once it goes, it, it gives me chills on a daily basis when I come in and I look at a Twitter feed or a Facebook feed and I see what's going on and how much content's moving. Because here's the other thing. Um, who can get to every school in their district and cover everything that their school leaders want covered? It's the great math problem with no answer. Well, it actually does have an answer if they cover it themselves. And if you have teachers and school leaders in each building, and remember, school events happen you know, seven days a week. There's sports competitions, academic competitions, things going on all the time. So a social media feed, unlike a newsletter, can populate seven days a week if you have enough people putting into the pipeline. And that has been the best part of this to me is we have content seven days a week, and it, and it just keeps coming. I'm going to breathe for a second. If you guys have any other questions, uh, feel free to fire, fire away. Um, excellent. Change. I, I, I want to talk about change again because I've done a couple of different webinars where this has come up. It's, that is the greatest obstacle to all of it, is people fear what they don't understand. And especially in social media, many of the people in education that I've worked with have, didn't have much experience in social media. So you really were taking them to the moon or Mars and saying, here's how it's going to work. Here's what we need to do. Um, I, I had a district where district leaders weren't a huge fan of social media to start with. There had been some bad experiences in the past. They don't use it personally. Um, so there was a big learning curve of, let me show you how this works. And the best part of all of that was when they would tour the schools and they'd see the success stories. They'd see the marketing of little business cards sitting on the front desk that say, hey, follow us on Twitter, follow us on Facebook. They saw it on the windows. They saw it in the classrooms and, they, and then they heard from parents saying, thank you. This is, this is an amazing tool to be able to use this. Um, live events are one of those things that it blows my mind. We're doing another one Friday. Um, but the first time we did this was a couple of years ago and it was an egg drop. And it was an egg drop to where kindergartners go out and they build these little foam and plastic bags and they put a raw egg in the middle of it. And then the teacher goes up a step ladder and poo, drops it. If it survives, it moves on to the next round. If it cracks, it's an emotional five-year-old mess. And either way, it was compelling to watch. So we've done these live. We've done STEM uh, robotics competitions live. And with very little marketing ahead of time, we just tell parents, hey, tomorrow at 11 a.m., come to Facebook. Uh, and come to Twitter and you're going to see your, your child compete in an event live. And a couple of times I've just been totally blown away by all of a sudden you had, I had a dad who was like, thank you so much for letting me see this. I'm sitting on an airplane in New York City. Or we had another um, parent that we went and we watched while he was working in a kitchen at a, at, a, at a hotel watching his daughter compete. And it was actually, we had cameras at both ends just to show how cool it could be when you can connect the classroom to where they can literally drop in for events that, you know, what, what's our, what's, what's the big thing that we always ask for? More parent participation. Why they can't get there, they don't have, have time. Jeremy, I see you just popped in something. Okay, great question, because I, yes, I, let me tell you where you run into this. Um, like I said, my school district runs the gamut of affluent, high-end, I mean really high-end affluence, and then incredible poverty to where like we have certain schools that are in the top four in the state for free and reduced lunch and poverty levels. Um, we're also tops in the state for migrant populations. So it's a very different conversation at each school, which is why you have to have the conversation. I went to every school. I stood in front of faculties. I stood in front of um, administrative team meetings and I, and I literally took on every question you just said. This is one more thing we don't have time for. Okay, here's my response to that. How often does your phone ring with parents that, that are upset about something? A lot. How often do you have people calling asking for information about things and then you tell them, oh, go look at the website or, or it's not on your website? These are communication issues. 
I, I maintain 80% of the issues that, that land on a principal's desk start as a communication problem. They flare up, they get bigger, they may be discipline related uh, in, in other areas, but my promise to them was if you communicate better, the phone's going to ring less because people know where to get information, they know the, they, they're attuned to where it's going to come from and what they need to do. Um, we don't have time for it. And I say, well, great. So you don't have time to properly communicate with your parents. Well, no, 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 no. We, we want to communicate with our parents. Okay. Well, let me take something off your plate. So you because it is, if you're going to put something on the plate, you got to find something to come off. Um, the teachers will move on this quicker than the admin will of a school because the teachers, you know, our teachers every year have had something added to their plate, whether it's, you know, from the state or new programs that come along. Um, but School PR people have reacted worse to this. And again, I've made, I made this presentation last year at Ensper. I've done countless webinars. I've done state presentations. I have more trouble explaining this to my colleagues than I do teachers and principals. And here's why. A teacher works seven days a week. So really when you're at, and, and I can prove to you, if you look at our Twitter feed, how much content comes in on a Saturday and Sunday when teachers uh, finally clear off their phone and put out the, the rest of the stuff. They're all posting during the week, but all of a sudden some more great stuff, they'll edit an iMovie and post it on a Saturday. Why would that teacher do that? Why would that teacher go that extra mile to actually edit something, produce it, put music to it because they find the value in it? In every classroom I visit, I ask them, are you hearing from parents? What are parents saying? Parents love it. Parents love it. And we have about 2% of the kids per room who, are, who don't have a media uh, waiver release that we just, they just, they aren't part of that. So um, parents are too uncomfortable with what they don't understand. Um, there's three fears here. Fear of violating student privacy, fear of I don't understand the technology, and fear of making a mistake. You have to take on all three of those fears to make this work. And believe me, I have spent countless hours on the front end getting through those things. Parents aren't too uncomfortable with it. I'll argue that assertion to start with. Um, go find any f f uh, two-year-old to 18-year-old right now and tell me their entire life isn't documented on Facebook by their parents. These same parents who say they're uncomfortable with it will go to Walt Disney World or Disneyland and put a bracelet on with their credit card attached to it and track everything that they're doing. There's certain trade-offs you make, but they're uncomfortable with what we don't explain well enough. And one of the things that, I, that you explain through this is this is used to showcase the positive things going on in our classroom. Uh, this is gonna show your child doing great things. Find me a parent outside of a person who already has, if somebody says no on a media waiver, that's a non-starter. You don't, you don't, you respect that and you move on. But go find the people that will argue that. As far as proud of our reputation and don't see the need for this, yeah, there, there were schools that I stood in front of and said, listen, you're here. You're like a 98, 99 percentile performer. If you do this well, you're gonna go up that much. But your parents are going to expect this if other schools are doing it because you're great at everything. And, and those, those were slower climbs. I won't lie to you. Those were slower climbs. Some of those schools did not come along as fast as the other ones. The schools that jumped all over this were Title I schools that had reputations that had been around B or C, um, a lot of turnover, had younger principals, younger teaching staff, and they were hungry to change a narrative that was outdated about their school. Educational narratives last 10, 20 years, and people don't even remember why they think a school is no good when it completely could have changed over three times over. So, yeah, you'll have different pockets of people that will jump on this, they'll run with it, they'll be incredibly successful. But what I learned through all of this is teachers are innovators, especially, and you need a coalition of the willing. You're not getting everybody on board everywhere to do something like this. Yes, I have all 50 schools participating. Are they particip participating equally? No. Um, but teachers that are innovators, they're, they're doing Flipgrid. If, if you haven't seen what teachers are doing with Flipgrid, go look at the Call Your Schools page and look at what some of our teachers are doing. App smashing. They're taking different apps together, putting together, doing interactive teach back videos with students. Uh, it's amazing. So they're going to innovate. The, and, and the innovators will always be innovators. I'm saying harness that power. Give them the tool. Teach them how to use that tool. And they'll run with it. And they've run with it in ways that are just fantastic. I mean, who doesn't want to use FaceTime in a first grade classroom to do a live talk back with an astronaut? That's one of the things that, that our teachers have come up with. They're doing um, film festivals. Uh, we just had a fourth grade class do a film festival for the second year where they used Flipgrid to, to shoot the videos um, and they posted them to the parents so the parents could see them and then they did like the usual classroom tour and all. 
but that whole process has been done in a way that, that parents can share from home. Kids are doing homework assignments in high school here in biology classes where they're doing teach back videos to their teacher on Twitter, high school kids. Absolutely, absolute full engagement. Um, biology is one of those things that I'm not even sure is a subject I would have started as a social media uh, curriculum piece, but he's had incredible success with it and it started to spread. So. Yes, it's easy to get caught up with the negative. It's easy to get caught up in the resistance. There were days I went home after talking at different schools where you go, man, I don't know if this is going to happen. But I was passionate about it to the level I said, no, if, they, if I can get them through the fear, there's a huge positive on the other side of this, um, the kind of positive that can sway a total image of your district. Uh, my school district's in... Hey, Lori. Uh, I'm with Collier County Public Schools in uh, Naples, Florida. So Collier Schools, uh, Collier County Public Schools, if you look us up on Facebook, uh, we're there, we're also on Twitter. Um, but yeah, as I was saying, our district is an A district. We're number five in the state out of 67 school districts. School districts in Florida are huge. 50 schools, 47,000 students makes, makes us a medium-sized school district in Florida. So we were, t we're top five, um, you know, our graduation rate has climbed. All, we have all these accolades that you can point to. So we're not one of those districts that you might look at right away and say, oh, they needed an image makeover, so they did social media. No, we did it because when I got here four years ago, there was a lot of false information flying around and people, you know, politics run strong and people were, you were telling the narratives they wanted to tell. And, and I said to my superintendent, I said, when are we going to tell our story? We have great stories to tell. I go in and out of all 50 schools. I see amazing every day. How come the general public doesn't see amazing? And there's only so many tours you can do and so many groups you can bring through. But if you have a feed where all the schools are pulling together and they're showing they're, they're awesome every day, that's pretty powerful. And I use, I use this analogy. There's always going to be an undercurrent of negativity. Of people are always going to be critical of what you're doing, and they should be. That's their job. It's their job as a consumer to be critical of the product. Um, but you have a tidal wave of positivity that can wash out the uh, small minority of comments that may be the undercurrent of negativity. Be balanced at least. I mean, at least put your, put your best foot forward, show what, what makes you special. Um, you know, we're producing brag sheets for our, our district and our school for that reason. Brag about what you're good at. Work on what needs improvement, but brag about the stuff that's working well. Um, our school dis district's about the size of Delaware. You know, I mean, literally, Delaware would fit in our county. Um, that's a lot of ground to cover. And it's a lot of, you know, getting places and getting people to schools uh, can be a challenge. And this, this tool to me just unites it in a way that um, it's crossed over. The last thing I'll say on that is um, Twitter is the number one professional development tool I've ever found. Uh, when I joined School PR four years ago, I had come out of television news. I didn't know anything about education. Um, going to Ensboro was a huge piece every year. Um, and... Twitter allowed me to find people like Andrea and other people that that I could pull information from and say, okay, I'm not crazy. What I'm what I'm trying to what I think should work here. Um, if you if you join late, my my philosophy is school PR is the news service for the school district. We replace all forms of media because we have all the tools. So building relationships with people that that own the products we use, building relationships with people that I look could look at and say they're doing innovative things, um, was an acceleration to what I was trying to do in a big way. Uh, I never in a million years thought after a couple of years of being in this industry, I would be at a national conference presenting. And that was, that was cool to me. It was cool. And, and going and being able to just share strategies and share ideas with, with everybody has been fantastic. I tell my kids that. I said, if you're not using Twitter as a professional development tool for whatever you want to learn, my son's a runner. And I said, you can be contacting the best runners in the country and getting feedback. He did it, and somebody wrote back to him, and it blew his mind. But that's the power of social media. The power that goes the other way is somebody saying something nasty about you. Um, but that's also the, the reality uh, of where we live and what we do. All right, what else do you guys want to know? What else can I, can I talk to you about? I don't, I'm not one to sit there and talk all the time, at least not usually. But in an event like this, you have no choice. Thank you, Andrea, for sharing the Facebook page. If you were late, um, all, all 50 of our schools have Facebook pages and Twitter accounts. And then I have our tweeters, we call them, teachers who tweet, um, that, are, that are on in their own account. We have about 1,000 of them. All right, so we have to wrap up. 
Thank you guys for your time. Thank you for dropping in 26 of you that stayed with us the whole way through the technical difficulties. Um, if you have any questions, my Twitter account is at NewsBoss. Feel free to send me a direct message or uh, just tweet to me. Um, love to make new friends and love to add people to the Rolodex of school PR experts. Oh yeah, uh, how did I forget? We're going to talk more about it at the summer social media summer boot camp, and I'll I'll actually show you if you sign up for that. I will show you uh, the behind the scenes workings of what we have. I'll show you the documents we use uh, and all of that. Uh, there was one question in there I just saw. Who was it? Jeremy said, "Go straight to the super first with this, or start with the schools. Go to the super because you need the superintendent to stand up in a principal meeting and say this is a priority of mine. Once the super blesses it, it goes." Otherwise, the principals, you're, only, you're going to get hit or miss because if the principals don't see it as a district priority to, to communicate, they'll only go with what they're personally comfortable with. All right, everybody, hope to see you at the social media uh, summer boot camp in uh, June, uh, and uh, look forward to talking to you soon.